And the first reference to a city called Mecca is not till 741. Ooh, do, 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 do. Think that through. Okay, you thought it through, we'll go on. The first biography of Muhammad with an Islamic source is not till 833. Now let's put this all together. These are their conclusions. How did they come to their conclusions? Let's go through it and let's remember. Now remember, at the time that we're looking at to begin with, in 661, this is when the Muayyad period starts. That's how much of the world Islam controlled. So they controlled the five great cities of the Levant. These were cities that were, that were sophisticated. They had libraries. They could, they could read and write. Uh, there, there's no reason in the world not to have things written down, even as late as 661. Dr. Gan Gibson, when he looked around, he noticed that when you look at the Quran, and take a look at the Quran and look at all the geographical locations in the Quran. There are 65 geographical locations listed in the Quran. Over and over again, you find the, uh, that this prophet, interestingly, it only mentions that he's the prophet in Arabic. It doesn't give him a name. You will find Muhammad's name in Arabic only four times in the Quran. But he's known as the prophet who lives in a city, a settlement, but it doesn't give the name of the city. It doesn't give the name of the settlement except for once. And that's in Surah 48, Ayah 20, 28. So who is this man and where does he live? Well, we do know that he has daily contact with people from Ud. 23 times he keeps on coming in contact with people from Ud. 24 times he has contact with people from Thamud. Seven times these people from Midian. Which means he has daily contact with these people from these three different tribes. So where are these tribes? Take a look where they are on the map. They're way up here. Mecca's way down here. There's 600 miles between them. How did he have contact with people that are 600 miles away? Curious, isn't it? That's the first problem. Secondly, if he wasn't, if he's so far away, then what are we going to do with Mecca? This is the million dollar question. We do read about it in Surah 48, Ayah 24. I, mentioned, I said to, uh, verse 28, it should be verse 24. Surah 48, Ayah 24, this is the only reference to Mecca in the entire Quran. Yet it's such an important city. Why? Because when Adam and Eve were thrown out of the Garden of Eden, according to that, they're up in space, that's in Surah 7, they were thrown down, according to their traditions, to this place called Mecca. So it would be the first settlement in the history of mankind. There is no one earlier than Adam and Eve, right? It's where, Adam, it's where Abraham went, was living in Surah 21. If you look at Surah 21, he is in Mecca. I had no idea Abraham came from Mecca. But according to the Quran, that's where he lived. He goes into the Kaaba and destroys all the idols in the Kaaba. They throw him into a fiery pit. And then he's saved by an angel of the Lord. That sounds like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But what's it doing and what's that say about Mecca? That means at least Mecca was in existence in 1900 BC when Abraham was living, right? And Mecca is the center of trade, north, south, east, and west, according to all the traditions. This is called the trade route theory. Trade route theory made uh, 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 by, popular by Montgomery Watt. Now, we do know quite a bit about this place where this prophet lived, though it doesn't give it a name. We do know that it's in a valley, that it has a stream going through it, it has a parallel valley, it has a pillar of salt right outside, which this prophet goes by in the morning and comes back in the evening, possibly, uh, obviously referring to the wife of Lot, who turns to a pillar of salt. It has fields, trees, gray, uh, grass, clay, loam. It has olive trees. That's right there. should have red flags. And that there's a mountains overlooking the Kaaba. The problem is, Mecca is not in a valley. It does not have stream going through it. It doesn't have any water. It only has one well, the Zumzum -Zum well. cannot even accommodate the caravans that went there. It does not have a pillar of salt. There are no fields, trees, grass, clay, loam, or olive trees. There are no olive trees except for the Mediterranean world, 600 miles further north. There have never been olive trees in Arabia. So you can see there's a problem here. Because wherever this place is, it cannot be Mecca. So, what do we know about Mecca? I've just told you all that, so we'll go beyond that. You can come back to that. Those are all the things I just mentioned. Take a look at a map from the 7th century. This is a Byzantine map of the trade routes. Where is Mecca on that map? You notice? If it's the center of trade, if it's one of the greatest cities in the history of mankind, if it's the oldest city in the history of mankind, why is it not on any map? That's just a Byzantine map from the 7th century. Take a look at this map. This is the trade route. Again, this is, look or see where Mecca should be. Mecca should be right there. It's not on this map either from the 7th century. But look at what is at the center of trade. We'll come back to that. Dr. Patricia Corona noticed this, and of course she was curious because she looked at this map, which is from the 7th century, and she noticed that all the trade would have come from 
India over here and China over here and would have come right up through the Persian Gulf to get over to the Mediterranean world. The problem was the Sassanids here were warring with the Byzantines here. For 200 years they warred back and forth between the 5th, 6th up to the 7th century which shut down the trade going through here. It had to be redirected across the Arabian Sea down to Aden right there. And then from Aden it went right across, up across the western plateau, the western plateau of Arabia uh, from Aden going up to Najran, Sana, up to Taif, down to Mecca according to the traditions, back up to Yath to Tabuk, uh, Kaibar, and then on up to Gaza. Now, my 10-year-old son saw a problem with that. Let's see if any of you can see a problem. Those of you who were here last year, don't mention it. What, do you see, what problem do you see with that theory right there? Why wouldn't they unload it where? In Aden? Yeah, down there. Okay, Aden. Why don't they just go up what? Good man. He's as good as my 10-year-old son. <laughs> Absolutely. It's a no-brainer. If you're already on board ship and you've come off the west coast of India, why in the world would you take it across the Arabian Sea, unload it at Aden, go 1,250 miles overland, when you know that a ton of goods for going only 50 miles by land is the same price as going 1,250 miles by sea? That's why we do everything by sea today. Even today in the 21st century, we send everything by ship. So why didn't they keep it and go right up the Red Sea? So Dr. Patricia Corona, reading and writing 15 languages, goes back and decides to investigate from the 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th century, reading the original documents to see if this was true. And guess what she found? All the trade was maritime. None of it went through Arabia. There was no Arab name anywhere on any of the trading documents here on the West Coast. All the names that she could find came from here, Eritrea, Africa. They were the ones that loved to go on boats. The Arabs hated boats. That's why you don't see any ports on the western plaza, the side of Arabia. They were all camel herders. They were people that were nomadic. They were desert uh, uh, nomadic people. That's why there was no maritime trade with any Arab names. So this whole trade route theory suddenly was up in question. And then she looked at it a little more carefully. If you notice, I don't know if you can tell, but when it gets up to Taif here, it then goes down off the western plateau to get down to Mecca, a thousand uh, meters, and then it has to go back up a thousand meters to get back up to Yathrib. Mecca's not even on the trade route. The Arabian existing trade route, it's not even on that trade route, she noticed. Why had no one noticed that? For 1400 years, no one picked that up. She picked it up and wrote a book about it. And she just destroyed any notion of any to trade route because she just quoted reference after reference. She found that the here in Stesiphon, which is now today Baghdad, that's the ar archaic name for Baghdad, they came down here to Yathrib which is now Medina, and they found silver. They had silver mines there, and they went down to Taif, and they talk about going down to the south. No reference to any place called Mecca. Couldn't find any reference to Mecca. None. None at all. Until 741. 741 is the first reference she could find for Mecca. It's in, it's in the Apocalypse de Pseudomethodius Continuato Byzantia Arabica. Muhammad died in 632. Can you see the problem? That's over 100 years later. Obviously, there is a problem with Mecca. We just don't have any reference to it. Look at modern-day Mecca. Look what they're doing now. The fourth largest building, tallest building in the world. That huge clock tower. That is 45 feet across, that face of that clock tower. They're going to make it Meccan meet time. They are now transforming Mecca. They've uh, designed it very similar to Big Ben. And they want to make, take Greenwich mean time and bring it over to Meccan mean time. MMT instead of GMT. But take a look what they're doing. That's what they plan to do with Mecca. They're basically... They're cementing over the entire city. That's Muhammad's house. They've now cemented that over. That's Khadija, Muhammad's wife's house. They've cemented that over. Look at all the cranes. They're going to make 62 of these skyscrapers. Why do you think they're cementing everything up? They now know what we know. There is no history there. And what best to hide the history than to cement it all up so that nobody can investigate how old Mecca is. But here's the problem. If you don't have Mecca in the right place, then what are you going to do with the Qibla? See, the Qibla is the direction of prayer. Every Muslim knows exactly where to pray every day, five times a day. doesn't matter where they are in the world, they always play towards.